this week's Technique Tuesday video, I'll demonstrate the mock short row heel, which is a short row heel without short rows. If you'd like to jump directly to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. I have a sock here that I knit using the heel I'm going to demonstrate today, which is called a mock short row heel. So you'll see these two sock swatches over here, and these two heels have the same shape that this mock short row heel has, just kind of a trapezoidal shape. So, but these were not knit in the same way, they just have the same shape. So in knitting, there's often multiple ways of getting to the same end point, and, it, and that's true with this shape of a heel. This shape is often also used for sock toes, whether you are working decreases or you are working short rows. This shape is called an hourglass heel. So if you look at the hourglass shape like this, what you can see is that when you are knitting the heel, the first half of the heel is shaped like the bottom half of an hourglass, and then the second half of the heel is shaped like the upper half of an hourglass. So these are all hourglass shapes, but they are all constructed differently. So one of the problems with this shape of heel is that it's often tight across what we call the heel diagonal, the place where your, your leg turns corners and becomes your foot. That corner right there can sometimes be a tight fit with this type of heel. So all of these can be modified in order to overcome those particular fit issues, and I will talk about that a little bit at the end. So the way the first half of the heel is worked is that as you get to the end of a row, you will be working a decrease. You're going to work these edges so that they create what's called a beaded edge. You can see these bumps along the edge. For the second half of the heel, you will work across all of your stitches and then you will pick up one stitch at each edge um, before you turn around and then work to the other side, pick up one stitch back and forth so that you'll be increasing the number of stitches on the needle with each row in order to form the second half of the hourglass. When it's time to start your heel, you're going to be working with half of the total number of stitches that you have. So I have 48 stitches. That means I'm going to use 24 stitches for my heel. You want to divide your heel stitches into thirds. Now, in my case, I, because I have 24 stitches, I can divide it equally, eight stitches, eight stitches, eight stitches. But you don't always have a multiple of three stitches on your needles. It's very common, for example, to have 32 stitches. So there are a couple of ways that you could divide up your stitches. You could divide it up so that you have 10 stitches, on each side and 12 in the middle, or you could divide it up so that you have 11 stitches on each side and 10 in the middle. Regardless of how you divide them up, you want these two outer numbers to be exactly the same. I place these markers on the needle just to show you how to divide them. I actually don't like having markers on my needle. I'm going to put my marker up below the needle in between this stitch and that stitch. Um, and if I need to, I can move them later. Uh, I just don't like having markers on the needles. Just, just a pet peeve of mine, but if that's something that works for you, then by all means do that, two, four, six, eight. For this first row, I'm going to knit across all of the stitches until I get to the last two stitches, and then I'm going to work a decrease. I'm gonna work a knit two together. Okay, I have two stitches remaining, and now I'm gonna knit those two together. So on the second row, I'm going to knit this first stitch, and then I'm going to purl all the way until I get to the last two stitches, and I'm going to work a purl two together at the end of this row. 
So at the beginning of a purl row, I'm going to knit the first stitch and everything else will be worked either as a purl or as a purl two together at the very end. So I've got two stitches remaining, so I'm going to work these as a purl two together. Now I am on a right side row. So from now on until I have decreased all of the stitches that I need to decrease, the first stitch of a right side row will be a purl stitch. So I, I did a purl two together here and I would do a purl stitch at the beginning of a right side row. So what's going to happen from now on is the first stitch of every row will be worked opposite of how the rest of the stitches present. And the last two stitches of the row will be decreased, decreased based on whatever type of stitch the, the row has been. So at the end of a knit row will be a knit two together and at the end of a purl row, a purl two together. But the first stitch is always going to be opposite of however the rest of the stitches are worked. So I've done my knit two together. So now I turn to this side and I knit this first stitch because I'm going to work it opposite of how the rest of the stitches are worked. And now I do my purl two together. So I'm going to continue working back and forth and working my decreases until I have one stitch remaining outside the marker. So I'm about to do my last two decrease rows. I have two stitches on each uh, side remaining. And so I'm going to work those two and that will leave me with one stitch remaining. So I've just done my last decrease on the right side row. I have one stitch remaining. So I'm still going to work that stitch um, as a knit on the purl side, and I will purl across all of these to the last two stitches. So now I'm doing my final decrease on the purl side. So now I've done all of my decreases. I have one stitch remaining on each side here. I'm going to work two rows across all of the stitches. I'm going to do them in a very specific way. I, at this edge, because I haven't yet formed my last actual garter bump, because I've only done the decrease on the final side, I'm going to start with a purl stitch, and then I'm going to knit, just knit across all of these, no decreases at the end. So purl the first stitch, knit the rest. On the wrong side row, I'm going to turn. I'm going to slip this first stitch as if to purl. So I insert it just like I was purling, but I'm going to slip it. Um, and then I'm going to purl across all the stitches. And again, no decrease at the end, purling that last stitch. So now remember, I started with eight stitches out here. I have one remaining. So now that I have finished that, you can see that what I have along the edge here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beads along that edge. And I have seven beads along this edge too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now I'm gonna do the second half of the heel. I'm going to always slip the first stitch of every row. I will work across all of the stitches as they present. So if they look like knits, I'm going to knit them. Or if I'm on a wrong side row and they look like pearls, I'll purl them. And then we are going to pick up one stitch along that edge. So slip that first stitch, tighten it up, knit across. Now 
Now it's time to pick up a stitch along this edge. So what you see here is there's kind of these um, two, uh, two bumps here along the edge. You are going to stick your needle underneath those, those two little bumps and then you're going to wrap or pick the yarn the way you would. So you're just going to knit that. So you stick it under those two little bumps and you pull the yarn through. So now you have increased one stitch underneath that bead. You're going to turn and you're going to slip that stitch and tighten it as well. Um, I usually tighten after I'm ready in the second stitch and I'm purling that one. That one is, makes it a little easier uh, to tighten things up. And then I'm going to purl all the way across. So on this edge, we're going to pick up again, and you can see that little double bump right there, that bead. We have to pick up as if to purl, and I find this to be a lot more difficult typically. But what you want to do is, again, stick your needle in underneath that um, beaded edge there. You can see right here, I've picked it up. Uh, what I find easiest to do when I am picking up a zip to purl is to use my left hand needle and I'll just stick it in there. So it's more like I'm actually purling. Um, so then I, I treat this just like a regular purl stitch, you know, wrap the yarn around. And when I'm pulling that loop through, it helps me that I have that needle through there so that I don't get this working needle caught on any of the strands. You don't have to do that. If you are able to get under that beaded edge, wrap the yarn and pull it through without the help of a second needle, you can do that. It just depends on what works for you. But again, after you've picked up that stitch, you're going to turn, you're going to slip this stitch, work across and pick up another bead. So at this point, I've got quite a bit of the heel done. I still have two beads left to pick up on each side, but you can see how uh, this heel is forming. And what's so nice about it is that you don't see any heel, uh, holes along the edges like you can sometimes with uh, a, a standard short row heel. So it's nice and smooth on, on both sides. So I have uh, two more beads to pick up on each side before I'm done with the heel. Okay, so the heel is done and now it is time to resume working in the rounds. So when you resume working in the round, you're going to slip this first stitch and then you can work um, going all the way around. So it is nice and tidy on this side. There's no holes in it. And on this side, it is also nice and tidy. At the start of the video, I mentioned that these sort of trapezoidal shaped heels that like you see with an afterthought heel or with a short row heel and with the mock short row heel that I just demonstrated. One of the problems with these is they can be pretty shallow. So if you have a, a, a high instep, then you might find that it's too tight across here and also that your sock leg gets pulled down into your heel. So there are a number of ways that you can compensate for that and that you can create more room across this heel diagonal as well as more height in the heel. I did a series of videos a couple of years ago where I, I created more room in a variety of ways. These are different colors to show you the, the, the places where the modifications were made. So in some cases you might do increases but keep the, the heel turn exactly the same size that it would have been if you ha were using the original number of stitches. Uh, but another option is to do some increases but, inc it, but include all of those additional stitches in the actual heel turn itself so the heel is larger. In both cases you end up with more room across this diagonal and you also end up with a longer heel on top of it so that the sock leg doesn't get pulled down into it. The solutions that work for a short row heel will also work for a mock short row heel. So I have a small gusset right here. This is very thick yarn with large stitches, so I didn't need to add a whole bunch of stitches, but I did work some increases in my sock here to allow me more room in the heel and across the heel diagonal. 
So I'll leave links down in the video description to the series of videos that help you with these kinds of modifications. If you watched last week's Technique Tuesday video where I demonstrated a garter stitch toe for toe up socks, you may have noticed that I used a different technique for picking up the garter bumps in that video than I used today. Sometimes the technique I prefer to use in general is not the best choice in a specific situation and that was true in this case today. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.